red test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Great taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss. Hello. Back from? Palm Springs. Mm, looking pretty good. With a little cold. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> now, see, why in the world would anybody want to go to Palm Springs to get away from the cold to get a cold? I've never figured that out. You know, it's windy and cold there. Yeah. And you dress for the summer because it was hot in the sun. So. How wonderful. Yeah. I hope you had a great time. Yeah, I did. I yeah, and fun. you missed a show, and you see, you, you could have had fun here. We had a, we had a really nice time. There's but always pluses and minuses <laughs> in everything in life. Let's get philosophical. <laughs> Dennis Lopp is here, and he's busy stirring because what are you making, Dennis? I'm making a steak chili. Ooh. So. He's making a steak chili because our guest in the first part of the show is Gina Hyams, who's with us through Skype video. Gina, welcome to Great Taste. This is the 60 yeah, Minutes. Hello. This is 60 minutes of the most delicious radio you've ever experienced. And then really, Gina, it's radio that you can taste. So <laughs> It looks like quite a party you're having there in Iowa. Yes, we're looking forward to it. Gina is the creator of three very interesting, what do you call them? Cook-offs. Uh, they're, they're cooking contest kits. Okay, cooking contest kits. There's pie contest in a box, Christmas cookie contest in a box, which is the newest one. Oh, nice going, Kath. And chili cook-off in a box. And we decided to have our own little chili cook-off. I also made chili. So we're going to, is, by the way, is the temperature okay with that? I, you, I don't know what your temperature well, is. Well, I don't want it to be boiling. No, uh, no, okay, good. Hot. So as long as it's, it's warm, that's, that's perfect. And so this is safe for the honey bear. See, Dan, did I move too far, Jason? Or am I okay? Okay, see, I have to stand right here. This is safe for the honey bear. You can't sit there. No, you can sit there. Why of do course. we have a box of honey bears? <laughs> we'll get to that later. <laughs> We're moving that on top of the root beer. Okay, so um, <laughs> anyway, this is going to be a fun evening because we have Gina with us at the beginning of the show, and then we have Jack Dowd, who is the creator of a magnificent root beer, local root beer. I have been a root beer fan ever since I was a little kid, and I was so thrilled to taste Jack's root beer because it's marvelous. So we're really excited to have him here. And somewhere in the store is Gisela Isidori, our friend from Italy, and I, she's lost in, in uh, high V. so hopefully uh, somebody will find her eventually yeah, and, and she'll show back up back. again. Yeah. We never know. And we actually have the youngest member of our audience, I think, that we've ever had. That's great. How old, Brian? Seven months. Seven months. All right. That's fantastic. Yeah. So... We're, Gina, welcome to Great Taste. We're a little crazy here, and usually that's the way it is every week, so that's what you get. It looks like, looks like fun. Well, I think that you're perfect because even though you've created these three cook-off contests in a box, which we're going to get to in a few minutes, you've done a lot of different things. I'd love for you to just tell everybody a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I was born in Florida and raised in California, um, and I spent a lot of time in Mexico, and now I live in Massachusetts. And in terms of publishing, um, I've published about a dozen books now um, on topics ranging from um, Mexican um, travel and decor and traditions to the history of incense to uh, spas. It's been a very eclectic career. The food, the food part is the a newer chapter for me. And we're thrilled because the reason that you actually, we found out about you is because one of our friends, Beth Howard, who is the writer of a wonderful memoir called Making Peace, said, hey, you need to have Gina Hyams on your show. So that's why has, you're here. Has Beth been on, been on the show before? Was she on for her memoir? She's been on way too many times, actually. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Beth and I were we were roommates at the National Pie kind of Championships in Orlando, Florida, a couple years ago. We were both judges. So hmm, that's interesting. Love, I seem to remember. That. Now that wasn't, or was it? The uh, there was an interesting story in her book about I think a Florida. I trip. make I make an appearance in her memoir. Actually, it's <laughs> my uh, my new claim to fame. <laughs> that's great. You are frozen for some reason. I'm not sure why, but as long as we can hear you, yeah. you know, it's, okay. it's, it's no big deal. <laughs> hey, Caleb, I don't know why, but Gina's frozen, but we can hear her, so that's, that's fine. 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's no big deal. We're fine. So anyway, how did you come up with these, this idea? When I first saw these pie contest in a box, Christmas contest, cookie contest in a box, chili cook-off in a box, I started thinking about murder mystery parties that people <laughs> have at their home. So how did you come up with this concept? Right. Um, well, in addition to being a freelance writer, I also do publicity um, on a freelance basis for many different cultural organizations here in Western Massachusetts. And one of them is a living history museum called Hancock Shaker Village that has a country fair every year that has a pie contest. And um, a few years ago, they asked me to figure out who would be the judges of the pie contest. And, um, you know, because I was the publicist, I wanted to kind of important people to agree to be a part of this so that they would talk about the pie contest. And what I found was that anybody would say yes to being a pie judge. The people were just tickled beyond measure. It was this powerful, primal thing to be asked to be a pie judge. Um, and just in the middle of the night, one night I woke up with this whole concept. I had a vision for a pie contest in a box with, it would have a handbook about the traditions of pie and pie contests and how to have a pie contest along with be a kit with scorecards and prize ribbons and judge badges and, you know, pie numbered pie toppers. It just, it all came to me in one swoop. Um, and I wrote the proposal and um, had a design mocked up and my literary agent sold it really quickly. Um, and so that was, that was the start. That sounds easy. Everybody could do that. <laughs> it just, you know, it was a time, it was right before pie became super trendy. I just, I had this, this very strong intuition that, that pie was going to have a moment. Um, and it was partly because of, um, the economy being so bad and, and, um, you know, that the idea of pie contests being this fun and expensive thing to do with your friends. Um, and that making pie and actually and chili and Christmas cookies, all of these things are very inexpensive to make and they can still be great. Um, so that plus people just loving kind of retro, you know, retro cocktails, retro styles. It just all seemed of a piece to me. So you didn't. Where's the cupcakes in a box? That that <laughs> there's another trend. Well, you know, we'll see how well these kits do, and it might go on. Who knows? <laughs> it could. It's the the. It could be canning contest in a box. It's really pretty endless. Okay, so what I'm going to do is Suzanne is right here, and I'm going to just ask her to come over here for one second. So now Suzanne wants to have. Suzanne wants to have a contest. Which one do you want to have? Do you want to have the pie contest, the Christmas cookie contest, or the chili cook-off? Which one? The pie contest. The pie contest. Okay. So I want you to tell Suzanne what she is going to get, again, just a little bit more in that box and what she has to do to make this happen because I think this is a really fun idea for a party. People could do this, and it's just really, really fun. Sure. Well, all of these kits, including Pie Contest in a Box, they have everything that you need to host your party except for the pie. So um, you, it's got a, about a 100-page handbook that talks about um, the anatomy of a pie contest, including all the steps that you need to go through. And I can, I'll, I'll walk you through a few of those in a second. Um, but it also has um, judges, uh, pie judge badges for your illustrious judges, and that's always a thrill, um, as well as scorecards and um, um, little little numbered badges or no, little flags for the tops of the pies to identify them by number rather than name of the contestant. Um, so obviously the first thing you need to do is figure out when you want to have it um, and decide who you'd like to invite to be your judges. And, you know, this can be, you know, your friends, it can be politicians, anybody you want to have at your house. Now, do you think you, do you have to invite people who know how to bake pies? Is that it? Or is it just no. for fun? You need to, well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's really, it's up to you how serious you want to be. My, um, the thing that I think most is most important is that the person loves pie. They can't, like, not love pie and be a pie judge. That would be wrong. Um, but as long as they love pie and they make you laugh, you know, it's good for me. That would be very wrong, wouldn't it, to have somebody who doesn't <laughs> love pie or somebody who's not eating sugar, for example. I think it would be a fun thing to do for, for, Thanksgiving, for Thanksgiving. Well, that would lead to the next, the next thing, which is you need to decide what theme you want to have for your pie contest. So, in fact, you could have a no sugar pie theme if, you know, if you had a bunch of diabetics who wanted <sighs> to have a pie contest, it could be done. I guess you're right, you, but you're kind of taking all the fun out of it. Now, what would be good? What would you like as your theme? Hmm. Theme and pies. Yeah, theme and pies. Fruit pies. Fruit pies. Okay, so she's, this lady is 
going to you know have a pie contest and she's going to have to report back we're going to give her your book your kit and she's going to have to report back to us what she does with it because that's oh, that right. those are the terms do you accept the terms I accept, I accept. okay please you can sit down now <laughs> thank you <laughs> okay so um, a fun uh, there's lots of fun themes that you can do you can have it by ingredient or you could have it be like family traditions have heirloom recipes um to you know, bring a sense of your family history to the pie contest. Lots of different things. Yeah, all those sound really fun. Now, who else that's here looks at the other two kits? Because I'm very disappointed because I asked people if they really wanted to win these, that they needed to bring Christmas cookies or chili. And the only two people that brought chili are Dennis and I. And I don't. I think usually they have like these little things that say that you can't win or whatever if you're part of the whole thing. So we're not going to do that. But now you see what has to happen. They have to report back in order in order to qualify to win. They have to report back. So Suzanne said she would. Now anybody else have? Okay, why not? Come on over. <laughs> and your name again? I'm sorry. Jason. Jason. Jason has been a tremendous. If you want a sous chef and you need one out of the audience, he is fantastic. Uh, let me tell you, he is. He's just great. So if you need anything, Gina. You know, we can get Jason, and he can help you out here. So, Jason, tell me, which one do you want to go for? Christmas cookie contest or chili cook-off in a box? Uh, the cookie contest, the Christmas one. All right. So this is your newest one. Yes, and, indeed. And, Coming right up. Ooh. And uh, is it any different than the others, or is it all about the same? Um, it's a little different in that um, for the previous, for the pie kit and for the chili kit, um, I had about a dozen, 13 um, recipe contributors from champion pie contest winners and chili contest winners. And with cookie contest, Christmas cookie contest in a box, um, I found that in fact it's a new kind of tradition that I'm starting with this kit, that lots of people have cookie swaps. Um, but this is new. So it's um, the recipes are from very brilliant and passionate um, uh, cookie bakers. So it's it's a bunch of cookie experts giving their favorite cookie recipes. We're doing our holiday baking show the third Wednesday of December. Are you willing to accept the assignment of holding a party, Christmas cookie contest in a box prior to that, and then reporting back with the winner? And I want some concrete results also. Yes. All right. Give him a hand, will you? And give Suzanne a hand, please. For all right. Well, you you can sit down now. <laughs> and I see that. Uh, did I see that? Our did Gisela? I thought I saw her walk in here once, but then did she leave? Yeah. Oh, there she is. Oh, <laughs> I, we were hoping we wouldn't have to go find you in the store, but but uh, that's quite all right. She's here. So so we have one more to give away before Gina segment is over, and it's chili cook off in a box. Now, what we could do is we could taste both the chilies and have a, a little vote, voting contest, but we're not going to do that. No, I think we should definitely do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, that could be embarrassing for the cooks. Dennis, we. Oh, I, go ahead, Gina. I want to know if either of you have a secret ingredient in your chilies that you made for tonight. I think Dennis really does. Two. Go ahead. I have two. Well, um, the first one is chocolate. I, have, I will have chocolate in mine. It's not there yet. Um, and then, uh, let's be a little bit more specific. Oh, a Hershey's Kiss. <laughs> a couple Hershey's Kisses never hurt you. Um, and then the other one is a more abstract hidden ingredient. It's not really an ingredient as more of it is a flavoring. And that is hickory smoked. All of my vegetables were hickory smoked before I put them into the chili. Sounds oh. very good. Do you have a favorite recipe that was contributed by one of uh, the, the great chili cookers of all time? Um, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna um, incriminate myself by choosing one. Um, what I love about chili is that it's so diverse. You've got, you know, Republican hunters who love, you know, venison chili, and then you've got vegan, you know, vegan chili, and both people, you know, love their chili, and they agree that chili's a good thing. Okay, well, Dennis asked me, he said, are there any rules here about the chili? And I said no, right? Anything well, it goes. Depends. Whoop, I lost you. There you go. Um, uh, well, if you're from Texas, there are lots of rules, okay. like no beans. Um, there's um, lots of cook-offs in Texas, and they're like straight red meat chili. It's just about meat and the chilies, chili peppers. Um, but, you know, it's a big chili world. 
That's right. And our chili world is completely open for whatever anybody wants. So Dennis has a beef chili going, and you've given your secret ingredients. And I have a vegetarian chili, and I suppose it is vegan at the moment, but <laughs> but it may You're not be cheese. at the yeah. end, depending upon what people want, want to do with it. Because for, for me, chili, I grew up in St. Louis, and St. Louis is an interesting chili place because it has a, a kind of two traditions of ch chili, neither one of them that belong to Texas. One is O.T. Hodge Chili Parlor, which has been around since, I don't know, maybe the turn of the 20th century. And I used to go, my wife was just, she just couldn't even handle it, but she was so sweet to go with me when I would go to O.T. Hodge. And I would have always at O.T. Hodge, it was the kind of place where when they came to your table, they basically, they took your order and then they yelled it back to the counter. So it's like, you know, whatever you ordered, it was four people, they just started screaming it across, you know, however many people were in there. It was a small place, fun place to be. And I had always what was called a slinger. And a slinger was chili with beans, by the way, uh, two eggs, and two cheeseburgers. Oh, so, whoa. All, all, all yeah. in a bowl. Full. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and then after that, heartburn. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you didn't have to pay extra for that. So, Were, were the eggs hard-boiled or were, scrambled? They were, or? They were medium, uh, over medium. Oh, that sounds and, so and, bad. It was absolutely <laughs> magnificent, and and uh, I, ha I haven't had it for quite a while, but I would love to actually think about thinking about it. makes makes those flavors just pop up in my mind. I love that. But the other s tradition that St. Louis had for chili is St. Louis was the birthplace of a chain that's become quite uh, it's spread out over the years. But it used to be just in St. Louis called Steak and Shake, and I don't think it's in the East yet, but it's definitely throughout the Midwest. And Steak and Shake had chili. Their famous chili was called Chili Three Ways, and they sure served chili with spaghetti noodles and chili beans and meat and then Parmesan, not Parmigiano, Parmesan cheese on top of that. So that is actually a, that's a Cincinnati, that's right. Cincinnati chili. Right, so that they was imported it. that was their version of Cincinnati <laughs> chili. Exactly. It yeah. was it was a little drier actually than the Cincinnati version, but but not much different than that. And and uh, so so that that was my introduction to chili. And this is a lot different. It's it's basically a uh, beans, tomatoes, and garlic, onions, chipotle, chili powder, salt, and I think oh cinnamon. So cinnamon would be one of my secret ingredients mm -hmm. and let's see there might be one oh uh cumin toasted cumin is another one sounds delicious so and then what i would do and anybody who wants to that's in the stu in the high v club room can have some grated i like to put grated cheddar cheese sharp cheddar cheese on it instead of parmesan or parmigiano so all right we'll see what happens anybody that has a really favorite chili recipe that they want to share with us I see some chefs in the audience. They don't have any favorite chili recipes that they want to share with us. I see. One of our chefs said whatever said somebody chef else makes. That's beautiful. I, I I like that. That's 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 terrific. Okay, that, that's cute. All right. So, Gina, I, I'd like to know. I'm sure that you must have some people who've written you and said, "Oh, Gina, we did this contest, and it was like so much fun, and uh, something really weird happened." <laughs> Um, I haven't heard about really weird things happening yet, but I've heard I got, I got a great letter for, from some girls that uh, some college kids had had used it in their dorm and they'd had a blast. Um, no, no, no big controversies yet. Mostly, I'm hearing you know that it's bringing people together. That um, especially like families around the election season where there's so much discord, um, people were using these kits to just kind of all get along and agree on you know, whether it was pie or chili, that, you know, they could all agree this was something that they all loved. Well, that's good, because I did hear something that I know that, you know, I'm sure you didn't say, which was these kids were cooking in their dorms, because I know that's not allowed. So, um, you know, we, we want, luckily you didn't tell us what college it was, so we can't report to the fire department on that one. I, I think it's a, it's a terrific idea. And, and one of the things that I, I like about it more than anything is that it's not technological. It just seems like today... I was talking to somebody last week, and they were saying that it's impossible, almost, to go out with a family 
or to be in a situation without everyone in the family being on their cell phones or being on their iPads or whatever it is. And we got a letter, my brother-in-law got a, my son-in-law, sorry, got a letter from his brother who was in New Jersey after the hurricane. And the letter basically said, our kids are going crazy because they don't have their games to play, their electronic games to play because they didn't have any juice left. Mm -hmm. And his mother sent him a letter saying, uh, what about board games <laughs> and, and decks of cards? So this is, this is great because it fits right into that. And it's just a way, as you said, of people actually doing things together. And Absolutely. You know, one, one theme that a lot of people are doing is um, like mother, daughter, or, you know, it could be father, son, just uh, parents and kids cooking together and entering as teams. People are having fun doing that. I'd like to, I'd like to actually see who, who's interested. Raise your hands if you're interested in holding a chili contest in your home because what? Nobody's interested in holding a chili contest? Brian's interested. Okay, now were you in the room though, Brian? I just want to make sure you were in the room when the assignment is that you, if you do it, well, A, you have to do it, and B, you have to report back on the results explaining, you know, who won, why they won, and, and what you did. That's, that's part of the joy of winning. Okay, ask Megan. Okay. Uh, okay, great. All right, so you're trying to get out of it. You're okay with that? All right, so can we do that, do you think? Okay. <laughs> Uh, all right, we'll wait and see. Well, he may. He said that he had to ask his wife. So, all right. Well, let me, let me just tell him Sorry. one thing that about it that's easy awesome. about it. What? Tell us. Um, which is that the contestants they can just bring their chili entries in crock pots. So you know that makes it easy in terms of you know just logistically the chili is a little bit the most complicated of the three kits for because you have to keep the chili warm. But you can use crock pots. You could use Dutch ovens on the burners on your stove. You know, you don't, it's not for a big, it's, it's, um, it's, it's for up to 12 contestants, but you could have, you know, you could have five chili contestants and it'd be still be a really fun party. So is that about the same number of participants for each of the contests in a box? Yeah. All, all of the kits are designed for 12 contestants and five judges. Plus there's a people's choice component for all of the contests. So everybody who attends the party gets to judge, gets to vote for their favorite one. And is that, do they do, does their vote count as much as one of the judges? They well, it counts for a separate ribbon. So there's first, uh, there's three prize ribbons plus people's choice. People's choice, I get it. That's great, Gina. Thanks very much. It's really been fun to t to talk about this with you, and I I really am excited. You know, if if we can't find anybody who's really up for the challenge, we might do it ourselves. That that would be fun because I haven't never tasted any chili that you've made, Kathleen. Have you made chili before? Turkey chili. Turkey I used to chili. make quite a bit of it. Yeah. I haven't made it in a while, though. Why? I don't know. Well, invite me over. And make some turkey chili. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do that. That'll be really good. <laughs> Gina, thanks again, and <laughs> stay in you. touch. We'd, we'd love to talk with you more as and find out what, what you're up to, because it sounds like you're always involved in some very interesting projects. Well, thanks so much for having me on. It was uh, fun. All right, and have a nice holiday season. Thanks. Okay, okay. Gina, Gina Hyams, creator of the cook-off in a box, there's chili, chili cook-off in a box, Christmas cookies, let me see that, let me see that one, thank you so much, Christmas cookie contest in a box, and the last one that Suzanne has right here is pie contest in a box, everything you need to host a contest, whether it's chili, pies, or Christmas cookies, thank you very much. Thank you. So you're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar power voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss. Kathy Dubois is here. Dennis Lopp is here. He's just sweating over the stove, right? Because you've got your chili. Well done. <laughs> I love the fact that you hickory smoked everything. That's great. I know. That's you know, so I great. To, I, didn't, I didn't smoke the meat, um, but I did all of the vegetables. And I thought it just would be a nice different flavor component than um, what I normally have. Mainly because I have an access, we have access to a smoker here at the store, and so I like to play with that and see what happens. So. Very, very, very good. Oh, I can move now, can't I? Can I go anywhere I want? Yeah. Okay. Anybody have a chili question they want to ask Dennis about about what he did, or that you can ask me about what I did too? If you don't have one, that's fine because I'm going to talk. Oh, never mind. Brian, what's up? Uh, my mom used to add a little bit of chocolate to chili, 
When I was a kid, you ever heard of that before? Or? Yes, because Dennis has this, one of his secret ingredients. Look, you can see it in his hand oh, right there. <coughs> is but Dennis <laughs> Dennis uses a Hershey Kiss. <laughs> <laughs> just, I think that's just, really it's cute. About, it's, about, it's about the right amount of chocolate. One or two, depending on how full your pot is. One or two, it's like the right amount. So. What does I, it do? It's, what does it do? Yeah. It sweetens up the chili, balances off. Because um, I put some um, Tabasco in there, and also there's some red pepper flakes, and so it balances off some of the heat um, that's in there and gives it just a little bit of a, a nice aftertaste as well. Usually the spice hits you first. And then the sweetness from the chocolate hits you afterwards, so it leaves you nice and complete. You don't really taste the chocolate. It's the whole Tom, thing. if you want to talk, I'd love for you to talk. Come up here, please. Um, Everybody wants to hear you and see you because nobody can hear you and see you back there, though. Please, come on. Come plus, on. It, come on. No, you're not finished. Come on up plus here. It gives you a I reason. want to introduce you anyway because Tom Krupa is one of the people who is at our show almost all the time, and he always is sending me fantastic information weekly about food. And I really appreciate that because it's it's fascinating a lot of the stuff that you send. So, tell us a little bit about chili. What 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 were your questions? Because I grew up with somebody, uh, my, my friend's mother used to make chili, and for years I'd say this is the best chili I ever had. And she said, my secret ingredient is chocolate. So when he mentioned that, I thought, okay, she. But I've never had any chili like this since then. So I don't know whether she used syrup, whether she put blocks of chocolate, you know that and let it melt in. I'm not sure. So that's why I was asking him. We'll you have to check. Well, check. You can't eat what he made, though. No, but, I but uh, And there's no chocolate in mine. But what do you have any idea what could have made it so distinctive? I mean, was it with beans, typical? It was beans, you know, hamburger meat, I guess you call it. Mm -hmm. And she had some spices. And then it was, I guess it was sweet. I never, you could never taste the chocolate. And that's but why I, I was asking him. I think never. the chocolate provides more than sweet. It's like, you know, when you have a mole, yeah. it has something like 27 spices, one of which is chocolate. Chocolate's considered, I think, one of the spices in mole, isn't it? Well, we have people who can answer that question in the <laughs> audience. I don't know whether either of them, since they're probably considering themselves off, I don't know if either, oh, Liz is willing to talk about it. That's great. I only made a mole one time. That was enough for me. It took me all day, and that was like, forget it. I'm not doing that again. But <laughs> it was it was really good, but it, it took eight hours, I think. So Liz Peralta is here. Chef Liz Peralta, excuse me. So? Well, the chocolate also adds um, texture. So it kind of makes it velvety. And, uh, you know, um, when I do use chocolate in cooking, it's usually bitter I don't, and powdered. Yeah, uh, and I usually get also uh, raw cocoa powder, mm -hmm. and it it adds texture. So when you're when when you're done when you're done with your soup or your or your stew, it's just this velvety texture in your mouth. That's mainly what it does. And, and for a mole, for example, a chocolate there are ch there's a chocolate mole, right? Yes, absolutely. And but it, there's no sugar. And they use raw chocolate. Mm -hmm. you know, they grind their their cocoa, and it's 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 pretty pure. It's an accompanying sauce to different dishes, then. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it just adds a complexity to the the spice mix. Correct, correct, yeah. and it kind <coughs> of uh, um, makes it. It's a round. It's a round flavor. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can imagine that when you're eating it, it's 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 much more it completes the flavors. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, in in Asian countries they use all different they use sweet, sour, uh, salty. So it's a way to to have a, a, a complete flavor. That's the whole point of the chocolate. Would you do me a favor and hold the microphone for me and let me talk into it for a second because I want to show everybody something and tell people who are listening about it. Because um, Liz actually just came back from Spain, and she brought me a gift yesterday, and I was so excited about it that I had to bring it to share because it's just so... You should have worn it today. I, well, you know, it's really supposed to be worn with a chef jacket, and since I never wear <laughs> chef jackets because I'm too embarrassed to do something like that, but I might do it sometime. It's absolutely a magnificent apron. And, I, you know, I've tried to describe it. It has all these... It's a black apron. It has all these oh. emblems on it. And it's, it's beautiful. And she actually, this was her apron because she just wow. came back from participating wow. in a contest, in a tapas contest in Valladolid, Spain. So you want to talk about it? And I can, I can hold this again. Uh, sure. It was, it was a, an amazing experience. I could never thank Chef Gordon Rader enough for the opportunity. And uh, we traveled uh, to a competition in Valladolid. 
and it was uh, not just we traveled with a student and she participated Kelly Vetter um, but it was also for professionals but the experience was much more than the event itself it was about the people about the food I've never eaten so much in my life um, the wine was amazing um, everything about this place the connection to what they cook and what they eat was truly amazing and eye-opening. Um, there's nothing like talking to people and have them look you directly in the eyes all the time. And um, it was, there, there, there aren't any words and there's no way I could ever repay Gordon for the, that great opportunity. And we were able to achieve so much while we were there. Um, hopefully soon we'll be able to um, interchange students and maybe even professors. Um, it was it was it was completely successful all the way around. It was wonderful. Thank you, Liz, very much. So yeah, it was really great. And thank you again for this gift. That's fantastic. So speaking of really being connected, I want to bring up Jack Dowd because he is our next guest because Jack is really connected to making some fantastic local products. So come on up here. Let's let's where should we stand? Is this a good place, Jason? All right. So we're gonna stand here and Kathy's gonna move over just a tiny bit so they can see you because we have to see you. So <laughs> anyway, Jack, you started out making kombucha, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, we have six flavors here in Fairfield that we make and we sell throughout Iowa. Um, and just Tell everybody, even though some people, most people may know, tell us a little bit about what kombucha is. Um, kombucha is a cultured tea, so it's and it's got a lot of probiotics and organic acids and things that are good for digestion and detoxifying your liver. Um, so basically, what we do is we make a sweet tea, and then we add a culture to it, like you would add to make yogurt or something, except that it's non-dairy, and then it brews for about two weeks, and the result resulting process um, gives you kombucha. And you have numerous flavors and they're absolutely delicious. And it's it's a great way to, let's say that you, for example, have a soda habit. You can get off the soda habit really easily by just drinking kombucha because it's really wonderful flavors and it's got the carbonation that people look for in soda. But what's really happened now, the reason that I'm so excited to have Jack here with us is that was it last week or the week before you introduced Jack's Real Root Beer? Yeah, I think it was last week that we introduced that. We're, we're serving that now at Cafe Purdy, so on tap. Um, but yeah, we, we, um, we decided to make a, a soda, I guess, and, and we wanted to make it healthy, so we, we brew it from a whole um, organic ingredients, and we try to use less sugar and um, no preservatives or anything like that. So I don't know. Has anybody had this? Okay, so Laurie, you've had it. Okay, great. I've had both the bottled version. Yes, Gisela's has had it. Uh, we've had the bottled version and the draft version. And when I was growing up, root beer was just something that I loved to to have. And any time I could try a different root beer, I did. Uh, most of the root beers that I had, of course, were pretty common use. A&W root beer was actually good, I think, at that time, or my taste buds weren't very developed. I don't know which, because today if I tried it it was it's horrible so uh, i'm just not sure but but they, we always would get it in a frosty mug at at a and w it was great and in in st louis hires root beer was very big and and dad's root beer was another one and fitz's right thank you thank you fitz's root beer is is also a, it's a local st louis root beer that's brewed there but this is oh he's fine he's fine don't worry and <laughs> and and by the way brian would you ask her about the uh, chili contest in a box okay good and we'll, we'll find out what the verdict is before the end of the show <laughs> so uh any, anyway it, it's just w something that i thought about a lot brewing my own root beer but always what stopped me was when people when i read about bottles exploding all the time oh yeah so we we don't carbonate it with yeast we we actually force carbonate it with co2 um but um yeah we just you know when we looked out there and all the other root beers um, most of them are just artificial flavoring and high fructose corn syrup. And um, there may be one or two that's actually brewed from whole ingredients, but um, there aren't any that are both organic and brewed from whole ingredients. So um, 
yeah, we just thought we'd make our own version and make it a little spicy and a little um, less sweet and kind of more more of an adult root beer. So what types of herbs and spices are in this root beer? Um, there's over 10 um, spices, herbs, and roots that we use. Some of them are um, sarsaparilla root, um, star anise, wintergreen, um, nutmeg, cinnamon, cloves. Um, there's... I can't remember them all at the moment, but um, and then instead of preservatives, we just use organic um, lemon juice, and that gives it a kind of bite to it. Do a lot of tasting and testing. Um, yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> uh, thank you. You should be here to help me every week. <laughs> um, the first, the first several recipes that I did ended up just tasting like basically tree bark. Um, <laughs> so. Luckily, I had people that would continue to taste it as I made new recipes. But um, I looked online for a lot of recipes, and, and you know, it just took a lot of trial and error until I figured it out. But Did it take a long time? I've probably been working on it on and off for about a year. Hmm. And, and why root beer versus other things? Uh, root beer just seems like one of those traditional American drinks, you know, and a good one to start off with. And I've loved root beer since I was a kid. Like Steve was saying, you know, when I was younger, we would go up to northern Michigan and always end up at an A&W restaurant with a root beer float. So um, I've always loved root beer, I think. I can't imagine, you know, if I had to give like 10 different foods that I would love or drinks that I would love, root beer floats got to be one of them. And, and I bet everybody probably root beer floats, right? I see every, people nodding, you know, yeah, root beer floats. And, and what other, anybody have any local root beers that they grew up with or that they know that are really, really special to them still or not? Fitz, as Laurie mentioned, in St. Louis. I mean, but there are a lot of places that have their own local versions of root beer, aren't there? Um, yeah, definitely. That's what's so fun about root beer is, you know, you get to a lot of people like to have root beer taste tests or blind tests, like you were saying. And, um, you know, you can kind of be proud about your favorite root beer and, and that kind of thing. I think there's... Oh, sorry, Kath. How do you make it? Do you have to boil it for a long time and steep um, it for a long time? I or? brew it, so I simmer it for about an hour with the different spices and roots and everything. So everything's just kind of thrown into a pot and boiled? Is that um, yeah, basically that? Yeah, basically, uh -huh. basically like you would make tea, except, you know, I simmer it for for about an hour. Yeah, and I know, I don't know whether you're, you're trying to get his secret recipe out of him no, or what, because he's not going to give it to you, <laughs> you know? Okay. <laughs> it took him a year to do it. Well, I've never seen a recipe for root beer, and so I'm just kind of, I'm curious. I have no idea how to make root beer. Um, yeah, so I, I, it's like, I basically like making tea. Um, I do caramelize the sugar, and... Um, I'm getting there. <laughs> Keep digging, and you might have the recipe by the end of the show. That's all I'm going to give you. <laughs> what kind of sugar do you use? <laughs> You're, Jack, you can take the fifth. We do. We use organic cane sugar and molasses. So. Ooh, great. It's. I think there's certain elements about root beer that maybe root beer lovers could agree on. I'm not. I'm not certain. Uh, but for me, one of the things that I think is is really difficult besides a really nice full body taste is the carbonation because I don't really like strongly carbonated drinks because I think they take away from the experience of the flavor and I was just so happy having your root beer and just the carbonation was just perfect as far as I was concerned so yeah um but like you said with root beer you, you don't want it to be over carbonated just gently carbonated you, and when people drink beer um you know they don't carbonate it nearly as much as soda is so um yeah and all, all the flavors can come out that way so i i really feel sorry for everybody who's just listening because because jack has a whole chest full of root beer here and and we have ice cream in the freezer so we're going to to have I think it's really important, though, that everybody after the show tries the root beer straight first. Uh, you don't have to follow directions, but you know, if you want to come back, you should, and and then you can try it with with the ice cream, you know, a bit later. Are you you are always in a hurry? Kathy Dubois is taking the ice cream out I of the like freezer. It to be soft. I know. Okay, she wants it to be soft, so that's fine. So uh, I I think that's another thing that that's I'm looking forward to because maybe you know that's another test for the root beer. 
when that ice cream starts to melt in it, how does the root beer stand up to it? So do you feel pretty comfortable that it's going to be okay? I feel pretty confident. I haven't, I haven't tried a root beer float yet, so we'll see. You haven't tried a root beer float yet? Okay, this is going to be good then. We're going to look forward to that. Without the ice cream. The toast as well. I'd rather not have the ice cream. Okay, how many people that are here would like to drink their root beer just plain? Uh, and how many like root beer floats? I think it's half and half. That's Especially if you're, try, if you're trying this root beer. Yeah, know, no, we have to try it. Everybody has right. to try it plain first. Absolutely. What? You, you, everybody can have both, right? It's no problem. Down, down. <laughs> it's, it's rough around here. And, and I'm going to give you another, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm warning you, because tomorrow, if you come back, because we're doing an extra episode of Great Taste at High V tomorrow with Gisela Isidori, who's going to be up here in just a minute. And we have a photo shoot afterwards, so you can't rush up and start grabbing food and everything because we have to first take the photos. So you just have to wait calmly for that. Tonight you can do it. Giving you 24 hour right, notice. Right, giving you 24 hour <laughs> notice. But I would also say that anyone who can hear my voice, they really should try to get here for tomorrow at seven because it's going to be quite fun and also delicious. And, uh, yeah, very, <laughs> no pressure. It's <laughs> no pressure whatsoever. So, so Jack, are you going to? Is this going to be available just locally for for now, or do you have any ideas about taking it further? Um, yeah, just locally now on tap, and um, hopefully we'll get it in bottles um, in the in the near future. Um, but we need to get some more bottling equipment to do that more efficiently. Yes, you you really need to get it in bottles, Jack, because otherwise a show host uh, for Great Taste is going to be very upset. And the other thing that I want to mention to you, because uh, we should talk about it, is there's going to be a festival this summer uh, here, a big music festival, and this is going to be a great thing to have at the music festival. We'll have to have, do root beer and root beer floats. So. Analyzing that sugar. And Absolutely. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much for visiting with us, and anybody who wants root beer, stick around, and we'll have some. Do you have a, do you have a question for Jack? Hold, hold on one second. Right now it's Jack's Real Root Beer. Jack's Real Root Beer? Okay. And great graphics, too. I love them. Really, really, really nice. Megan, great job. Really great job on the graphics. Really, really nice. Thank you so much. Well, if you look at the blog post at KRUUFM.com, you'll see the graphics uh, for Jack's Real Root Beer. And uh, the rest of you who are listening in the, in the audience will have to enjoy, I guess, as a virtual experience uh, while we all taste afterwards. But we're not going to do it while we're on the air, so that way you'll, you'll feel a little bit better. Gisela, can you come up here so we can talk for a few minutes? You're listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. We are, without a doubt, the most delicious 60 minutes on the radio, if I do, do say so myself. And we are coming to you live from hy V, the hy V club room. Come closer. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So Gisela Isidori is visiting us, and she is an absolutely amazing woman who is just so sweet and fun and she happens to be a really great cook and she also knows a lot about Italian cuisine so it also some American cuisine yes of course because, because this is your adopted home right yeah not only that but you know I have to adopt you know some very good Italian um, authentic regional recipe to what I found here and today we found buckwheat Yes, and you'll, you'll, have to, you'll have to tell everybody about that. Well, tomorrow night, it would be very nice to taste, you know, the pizzoccheri. That is a type of pasta that is only made, actually, it's only known and made in my valley that I am born near Switzerland. So it's at the border between Switzerland and Italy. And the buckwheat is the only place where they, we can grow some buckwheat. But um, now we have it in Iowa, so we try to do lots of things like polenta taranya is a polenta mixed with corn and buckwheat. Uh, we can do, pan you know, very good uh, kind of pancake, but not very thick, very, very uh, like crepe, uh, very crusty that you can have it uh, in a, for breakfast uh, with maybe jam or, or, or you can have it for lunch with um, arugula salad and some very good cheese. You melted. So. Gisela has a love affair with buckwheat. She, she. I do because I, it's what I grew up with. You know, we did not have a lot of other things. We had potato, buckwheat, uh, cabbage, uh, and um, um, mountain cheese. Yeah, very very good cow cheese. But um, mainly it was buckwheat made in many different uh, ways. 
because that's what we had. We did not have olive oil, so we really had to cook with butter. And um, very winter, you know, my, my town is now not anymore my beautiful little village where we were only 1,500 people. Now it's 30,000 people, mm -hmm. and it became like Cortina, you know, like Aspen. Now everybody is, they just go there mm -hmm. for skiing, and they lost a lot of, for me, it's not anymore my village. What's the name of the town? Bormio, B-O-R-M-I-O. And it's in a, it's the, first, the last town, and then it's the border of Switzerland going through the Silvio Pass. Or if we go to the Silvio Pass, it's about 60 kilometers to, from uh, Bolzano, Merano, uh, the Tirolo side, or it's about 80 kilometers from uh, St. Moritz. So we are really very close there. Um, they still have now, you know, in the restaurant, you still have the, you know, the typical cuisine from, uh, uh, from that area, and uh, it's a winter dish. So I introduced that to the New York restaurant in 1980 when I came, and I started to do pasta, special, uh, different type of grain pasta, and uh, that my husband and I researched all over the United States where was the grain, the native grain from the area. So we did buckwheat, we did kamut, we did black quinoa, we did blue corn, Every kind of rye, oat bran, any type of grain that it was available, we turned it into pasta. And we were, you know, we did pretty good. And uh, <laughs> Yes, but I, I want everybody to note, I want everyone to note, take note, she was way ahead of her time. Because at that, I'm sure, at that time, people thought you were probably crazy. Totally. But, um, <laughs> but no, not really. Because, for example, well, um, I had a very good friend who opened up the first... Uh, health food store in the U.S., the first one in the Tribeca area. And it was a beautiful, beautiful store. It was a crazy couple, you know, crazy, you know, but very, very good. And so he gave me, gave my husband and I a space to make the pasta, you know, in this, in this beautiful, we had, like, we had like two floors, so downstairs. It was the chocolate building, uh, built in probably late 1800 in New York, and it was beautiful. So we had, he gave me the opportunity also to know and where to buy the grain, uh, meet the, the farmer, and um, so the, the, when he said, I think you, we can, you can also make the pasta and sell it in my store, and then you can also do all sell to restaurant, uh, because we did two lines. One was on grain, and of course, it's all, it was only grain, water, and no eggs, just plain grain. So, um, like we did wild rice uh, pasta. I think it was the first one to ever make wild rice pasta. Anyway, my husband turned in every single grain into great pasta in different shapes because we had a machine that we bought in Italy and we made different bronze dyes. Uh, because it would be extruded, so no chemical, no touch of Teflon, 100% natural. So all these discs, you know, they have like bronze dyes, then we work out different shapes. So we had like 15 different shapes. So every grain was a different shape and was very unusual. Uh, my best set was Tutti Frutti, <laughs> and it was a little, um, uh, what do you call it? It's like little shape, uh, like the fusilli, but much shorter. And every single um, fruit that, you know, it was not sold upstairs because, you know, when you do veggies in those days, you do fruit and veggies that they were organic, they would go fast. You know, they would not last long. It's not that you put it in the freezer and then you set it after three months, you know, it wasn't there. So whatever we could use, like artichokes, uh, um, carrots, uh, or um, any uh, fruit, that, like berries, uh, apple, name it. Whatever was left over, we we'll take it and turn it into this tutti frutti pasta. Uh -huh. And then it was the best. But I had like Billy Joe wife, <laughs> always I come from my tutti frutti. That was Christy Brinkley at that time. I yes, think, yes. <laughs> Um, all the model because I always in those days I think that the people who was into uh, start to becoming organic 
you know, buy organic food and buy, you know, think about natural. I divide them in three groups. The snob, so they used to come with a big limo, you know, from, from uh, the stock market or the model, you know, because it was becoming very big in fashion. So that was the kind. I also had um, um, Robert De Niro. He used to live across the street and he used to send the poor woman to buy my book with pasta all the time because he's vegetarian, so he always wanted that. I had, um, uh, what is the, uh, the one, uh, the filmmaker. Uh, it's also Woody, Woody, Woody Allen bought my pasta. But and then, for, that was the snob. And I felt that, you know, like, because of the war, it was very fashion to buy that. Second, there were the sick people. You know, lots of people that have cancer or something, they have to come and buy. Like, the broccoli is very good for your blood. So they were really taking care of themselves through grains. For example, all brain pasta, it will cure your cholesterol. It will lower your cholesterol immediately. Which pasta? Old brain. Old brain? Yes. And the third one, they were the young generation. Very few young people, they will maybe come and bought quarter of a pound of pasta, mm -hmm. one tomato, because they didn't have too much money, but they were really going into this one. So that was my three clients for pasta. Plus I had all the restaurants, and then I had, you know, uh, Dylan De Luca, Balducci, all the fancy food, maybe because wow. we did not only do the grain pasta, but we did also fancy um, uh, favorite pasta. I was the first one 25 years ago to do ink pasta, chocolate pasta, uh, artichoke pasta, carrot pasta, truffle pasta, porcini mushroom, I mean, uh, rose pasta, we have this beautiful little rose, you know, with, with rose water and turn it into pasta. And then we made shake ravioli. Uh, it was fun. But at least uh, this was our business to support the cost to be in the state to make my daughter study. That's it. So after, you know, she went out of, she was graduated, we went back to Umbria where we used to have our farm. But I always said, thank God, you know, she will be staying here, she will get a good job so I can stay in the farm <laughs> for a few days, a week, and maybe a month, and then I can come back to New York. Instead, after one year, she moved back to Italy. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to find a way to come back and have friends so, so I can stay. So my best way would be, okay, I cook for you, I fold your laundry. I own your laundry. And, and, and I, you can give me an opportunity to stay in her house. So that's what I'm traveling all over. And what was the story? She's, a, she's a little, she's a little, you know, she's not really telling she's you the a whole gypsy. thing. She's a gypsy, but she, she has done many wonderful projects that hopefully we'll talk about some tomorrow. But I think that uh, one of the things that Gisela did too, which was really interesting in terms of how, uh, you know, because I've known Gisela for a number of years, uh, but I, just the other day we were talking and she said, oh, you know, Florence Fabricant wrote this article yeah, about me in 1990 yeah. in the New York Times. And I said, oh, let me see if I can find it. She said, oh, you can't find it. And I found it online. And when I'm reading it and I'm going, uh, she says, you can find Gisela at La Madre. With, it was a very with, famous restaurant. Right, it was a very famous restaurant in uh, New York at the time with executive chef Alan Pardee. And I, I said to Gisela, I go, you know Alan Tardy? You worked with Alan Tardy? Yeah. And, and she, she said, yes. And, and Alan used to, after he left La Madre, he opened a restaurant called Falanico at 22nd and Broadway at 5th. And I used to go there all the time because I worked in the building that was right, I just walked out the door and walked into his restaurant. It was a Tuscan restaurant. And he was he, just a really nice little place. And yeah. so we called Alan today and talked with him. It was really fun because he's in Piemonte in, in Italy running a winery now. So. Oh. Yeah, but well, you can imagine. Uh, that's why, you know, sometimes when I see all these people always on the computer, always on the iPad, always on the telephone, I really get, you know, it's too much. Especially when you go to a restaurant and you see family and uh, the, the kids will say to me, you know, they play, and they, you know, tell, maybe very, I was uh, in New York, and a friend of mine came in from, from Italy, the little girl invited this lawyer with two other kids. The three kids, they ordered lots of food, they never ate it, they were playing all the time. 
mm. on the iPad. And I think that is terrible. But in other ways, it's good because we connect with people, <laughs> you know. So yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a mixed bag. Uh, yeah, it's a mix. You know, uh, you know I think one of the things that I'd love to... One of, Oh, let me oh, trade you. We had a problem with our mic. Okay, so thank you very much for the trade, Caleb. Caleb Flynn is our engineer. We appreciate Jason Strong is here from FMC, and we're always thrilled to have him. Jan Slinton from Pathfinders has been standing in the back, and she was fantastic because today we had a meeting with Jan and a farmer, the farmer who's doing the buckwheat. We already have at seven. Nice. Seven Don't. fifty. Yeah. Well, for a fast day. But you were like me, I'm, a, I'm up like <laughs> <laughs> It's terrible living with me, I'll tell you. What, what can you do? Anyway, we're on Great Taste at 7 p.m. You can listen to www.kruufm.com. Thursday evening, a special bonus show, and also live here at IV. Gisela is going to actually enlist people to make different foods. Kathy is making two things, right? What are you making? Do you remember? I'm making an olive oil cake and a chocolate cake. There are recipes from Giselle. Right, and then you're going to make, uh, you're going to ask people to help you make buckwheat pasta? Uh, yeah, buckwheat pasta, uh, erbazzone, there is a, a type of, uh, I will say, like a tosta, like a pie, but it's Vegetable made, pie. Yeah, vegetable, yes. And uh, we must pasta fagioli, you know, pasta and beans, very good, very good. Uh, parmigiano Reggiano <laughs> um, rind cross the rind inside, uh -huh. oh yeah we're gonna put uh, we're gonna use the, the uh, rind right the rind the parmigiano in the, the rind, um, we are going to she's going to make a taste you know the olive oil cake that is one of the recipes that I kind of develop and it's excellent and very good for the morning uh, for breakfast and then uh, torta caprese that is a tart that is, I mean a chocolate beautiful cake from Capri is a special egg. because when I like to do when I do the cooking I like to really do more regionalized uh, so you know like the buckwheat would be from Lombardy uh, the pie erbazzone would be from Emilia Romagna the pasta fagioli is from uh, Naples the cake is from Capri you know the beautiful line and the olive oil is from me because I kind of invented it. <laughs> yeah. That's great. So that's on Great Taste, 7 p.m. on Thursday. I also want to mention that the library and wherever you are, your library, I'm sure, has terrific books. On your chair, you'll find a number of Italian books that you can find at the Fairfield Public Library. And we want to thank Heidi, of course, for hosting us on Wednesdays with Great Taste. Next Wednesday on Great Taste is Indian Hills. Culinary students will be here. And it's our Thanksgiving show, and we'll be doing all kinds of Thanksgiving beverages, I know for sure. Uh, we're going to actually show you how to make your own eggnog. Mm -hmm. And so that's going to be pretty exciting. There's a lot of upcoming events at High V, which everybody can take a look at after the show. They're all written on the whiteboard here. And those of you who are listening, you can find out about these events. You know, is there a way if you can come into the store? Because you didn't have, you used to have a whiteboard, but I haven't seen it now. We, um, we just got it corrected yesterday. Yes. And so it'll be up tomorrow. All right. And then we're also filming a segment on FMC about that and later this week. About your whiteboard? About the whiteboard, that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting things happening. I, I say, day. Dennis, that's awesome. I'm, I'm pretty impressed. I want to tell you something. You have come, about 10 seconds. Okay, come <laughs> for this too, because yesterday I was at Indian Hills. Indian Hills. Uh, there were 30 students. They had, they made 12 recipes. Perfect. That I, you know, I gave to them and they were incredible. So, come and get. Do you want to tell them about this? Or not. Oh no, we're not going to talk oh. about that. We'll talk about that tomorrow okay. if we have to. So, Dino De Luca, Balducci, Cittarella, where you fair way. And we'll have to talk more about that after the show because right now we've got to go because I'm sure that Andy Barterstock wants the airwaves in about five seconds. You've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss, and we'll see you again next Wednesday. <laughs> Great taste. Sweet. Sour. So good to taste.